Also, um, the, um, the whole um, issue of um, the buses. Buses are the final link for working people, people going for job interviews, people that need um, a functioning bus system that um, takes them where they need to go. I am very supportive of, of rail, but when you start misusing Measure R funds uh, and using um, funds that should go for buses and clean buses, look for some other places for rail. You might start with taxing some of the worst um, uh, people who have damaged our infrastructure in California, including the huge oversized trucks that trans go on our freeways that are like 50 cars because of what they do to our our freeway infrastructure. You better start thinking globally and you better understand that what we just experienced with the windstorm could come back again this year. Well said. Thank you very much. And so uh, seeing no other speakers and no speakers on the queue, we'll go ahead and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. That item is approved. We're going to go ahead and call item 8 special by uh, Mr. <coughs> Bloomingfield. Do we have cards on 8? Uh, Mr. Bloomingfield. You, and I, item 8? Public hearing was already held. So. Yes. But we are going to call someone up on this item. So, thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is a very important item. Uh, this is an item uh, I alluded to about a month and a half ago when the contract for the taxi dispatch uh, was coming up. But just to, to get you to understand what this is about, um, back in October, uh, I was on a plane. I read in The Atlantic uh, an article written by former major leaguer and ESPN, ESPN commentator Doug Glanville. He wrote, and he happens to be African-American, he talked about what happened to him when he had taken a flight to LAX. He came off the flight, cross-country flight. He was tired. He just wanted to get in a cab and go to his hotel. He waited patiently in line, the same line that all of us have waited in when we're, when we're catching a taxi cab. Uh, and when he got to, the, to his spot on line, the cab driver said, no, you take the bus. I'm not going to serve you. The taxi dispatch person who was there pleaded with the taxi driver, but the taxi driver was insistent and said, no, I'm not going to take you. The bus is only $19. You go take the bus. Clearly a case of racial discrimination. And then, finally, a cab behind him came up and said, OK, I'll, I'll take you. And one of the uh, workers, I think it was a Delta worker, came over to him and said, you know, this is the third time on my shift that I've seen this happen to, uh, to a black man. And I read that article, and, and I was just, my stomach turned about reading that. And I said, we've got to make a change and do better. Now, this is a good news, bad news story, because uh, as I described that day uh, in council when that taxi dispatch, I put a motion in to put forward a zero tolerance policy to uh, instruct the airport authority, LAWA, to conduct uh, a sting operation and figure out how widespread this is going to be and to take the, the necessary steps to uh, end this kind of discrimination. The good news is that uh, LAWA, our airport authority, was very responsive. They immediately started drafting up uh, new policies to, to meet the mandate of zero tolerance, and they went, when they went ahead and they, they did a sting operation, an undercover um, secret shopper type of thing. The bad news is what they found. When they did this undercover operation, they sent out two African-American undercover officers uh, to the central uh, airport t to solicit rides, to stand in line in the taxi cab, and five out of 25 times they were denied service. 20% of the time that they attempted to get a taxi cab, they were denied. That's the bad news. The good news on this is that we now have a policy that we're moving forward today um, that is a zero tolerance policy that builds on our city's non-discrimination policy. Um, we, we put it forward in the, in the new contract with the uh, taxi cab 
company, the dispatch company, for them to enforce. We've also added uh, additional reporting requirements so that uh, every incident like this has to get reported to the airport authority because that was another issue that came up was the fact that um, that the dispatch didn't report this. It had to, it was Mr. Glanville that ultimately reported it. So we are we are changing that. We're taking a very positive step forward. Uh, another bit of good news is they've since we've started making the, the we did the first undercover operation. They've done a few more, and they, those have not found discrimination because word is out that these undercover operations go on. We've instructed Lawa to continue doing that uh, several times during the year, um, and we've also moved forward on an additional motion uh, that, that will be coming forward in the future to not only hold the taxi drivers accountable, but to hold the taxi companies accountable. Because at the end of the day, we have something very valuable, which is a contract to do business at the airport. Uh, and we as a city, and I know every member of this council does not want to tolerate discrimination in any form. Uh, today, today's uh, effort, this uh, ordinance will move forward and will help us in that direction. Uh, and, and toward that end, I'd like to invite uh, Samson Manjitsu and Kat Nitsch from Lawa to the table to talk to us a little bit about uh, the new rules that are moving forward and answer any questions that, uh, that anyone here has. So if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how, how the, the, or, how the uh, ordinance will be different, how reporting requirements are different, and about the zero tolerance policy. Thank you, uh, Sam Summit, is to Lawa Operations. Uh, you've described the, 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 act, the board's action very, very uh, well. Um, the driver penalties will change dramatically uh, that we did not have before. Uh, and it will address specifically uh, any taxi service refusal for discrimination. Uh, that includes now uh, license revocation immediately. And before, uh, the drivers had an appeal right, and there, any adjudication by the company could have been appealed to the DOT. Now we have aligned our policies with working with DOT, uh, so that will be pretty powerful, we believe. Uh, the hearing and adjudication process has changed. The reporting requirement has changed. Uh, prior to this change, uh, that the, the dispatch company could handle everything without communicating with us. Now they're required to tell us of any complaint within two days. It comes with penalties, um, and also we are interested in, in communication with the people who actually make the complaints. So we believe all these changes will really make the zero tolerance uh, policy we wanted in place. And uh, as you suggested, we'll continue to, to do mystery shopping uh, and it will bring to end any uh, taxi service which is all based on discrimination. Thank you. Are there any other members are all closed? Yes, Mr. Blumenfield, we have uh, three members on the queue. Mr. Koretz? Thank you, Madam President. And I want to thank Mr. Blumenfield for his good work on this. I think it's always been a problem to some degree. I think we've known about it for years. Um, it's about time we took this action and doing the stings and doing all that is very positive. Um, the only negative piece is I assume that our cousin taxi-like companies, Uber and Lyft and others, uh, remain discriminated for because we probably don't do anything and are not contemplating anything to avoid that type, kind of discrimination with them. Um, and uh, I don't know if uh, a friendly amendment would be appropriate or just a direction to, uh, to make this effort with all those companies. There's no reason why they should be uh, uh, left out of this uh, effort to avoid discrimination, um, except that uh, we typically treat them differently. So I thank you for doing this with taxi companies, but I'd like to hear uh, what, what we propose to make sure those other companies that do virtually the same thing 
don't do virtually the same thing in terms of discrimination. Mr. Harris-Dawson. Thank you so much, Madam uh, Chair. And I first want to start uh, just by uh, really uh, giving a heartfelt thanks to Council Member uh, Blumenfeld and the folks at LAWA. It's great to live in a city where anti-black discrimination doesn't have to be brought up by the black guy or the black woman. And anti-women discrimination doesn't have to be brought up by the woman and LGBT and all the rest. This is a city where we stand up for each other and we stand uh, for justice across, um, uh, across those lines. Uh, I also think it's a very important issue for the city of Los Angeles. As someone who has flown into towns and couldn't get a ride in a taxi cab, it's not exactly rational. But when that happens, that changes your entire opinion about the whole town forever. And so anytime anybody recommends going there or doing there or shopping there or doing business with that town, uh, you get a negative reaction just based on that initial interaction after stepping out the terminal. Uh, the last thing I want to uh, talk about is the issue Mr. Mr. Koretz raised, which I think is very, very important. Uh, when we were going through the process of, of uh, approving or looking at the, the Uber, Lyft, and companies like it operating at the airport, that was my first, second, and third question is how do you monitor discrimination because we didn't want to bring discrimination from the old economy into the new economy. And actually, those companies have a system that allow you to check, independent of them, who gets picked up, who gets denied a ride. And in fact, if riders deny more than one person a ride per shift, they're taken off of the network. And it's something uh, that was negotiated as a part of that process. So I want everybody to know that we took a hard look at that uh, when they were up for discussion. And, and we think that they have a very good system. It would be great if the taxi companies had a similar system so we could, in fact, see, independent of their reports, uh, who they're picking up, who they're denying rides, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, <clears throat> Samson, just want to thank you again for your efforts to have your colleagues. Uh, I think it's significant that uh, staff acted quickly and the board uh, acted uh, equally quick to uh, put this into place. When, is this, when was this effective? And what happened to the individual who uh, exhibited the discriminatory behavior? Um, there was a, a hearing process by the, the company initially uh, revoked his license for a year. Um, he had the uh, opportunity to appeal to uh, a DOT. Uh, that hearing also took place. I think ultimately uh, the DOT hearing officer decided that the license revocation should be two weeks uh, because he, uh, the driver came and represented that um, he had a, a language barrier uh, he was. He did not mean to discriminate. Uh, so, but ultimately, uh, he was uh, uh, suspended for two weeks. And now, what would happen today if, if that same kind of behavior uh, was exhibited? Uh, it would be revoked uh, permanently for a week, for a month, for a year, permanently. Permanently. And the person would not be able to get a license at the airport again, or that is correct. Escape? Pardon? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Blumenfield, a close. Great. Thank you very much, and, and thank you all your members, all members, for the words about this important issue. I, I think it's important to note that you know today is the uh, first council meeting in February. It's the African American Heritage Month, and I think it's appropriate, um, you know, as we generally during this month we reflect upon how far we've come as a society, and we celebrate uh, folks who have done great things, and we celebrate. Um, African-American history. Um, but it's also a time when we need to reflect on that we need to go a little further. Uh, and this issue coming up today uh, during this month is helps us remember that and reflect on that and realize that that struggle is still continuing. But we as a city, uh, we are all very firmly committed to moving forward uh, in a very positive direction. It's It's 2016, and we're going to reflect that in our policies and our actions, and we're not going to tolerate uh, any kind of discrimination. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you, and I urge an I vote on this matter. If there are no more speakers, Madam Clerk, on this item, let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. 
Item passes. Let's move on to items 28 and 29. Call special by Mr. Fuentes and Mr. Coretz. Mr. Corin? I'd like to ask that item 9 be received and filed, please. Without objection. Mr. Kokorian, Mr. Weezer called nine special. Oh, for us. For purposes oh, of receiving purpose and filing. Of, very well. Thank you very much. Mr. Fuentes? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, colleagues, before us are two items that are very important that deal with the security issues at the Department of Water and Power. And the department has a presentation. I wanted to sort of just tease this a little bit for all of us. There are elements of this presentation that I think we can hear in public session. But there are questions that I have that we'll probably have to retire into closed session because it deals specifically with assets that are critical to the um, utility, thereby being very critical to all the residents of the city of Los Angeles. Now, I, I wanted to share with you all this um, it w very quickly because it is very troubling in that we have, because a third party review, determined that there are some vulnerabilities at the Department of Water and Power and its critical assets. Now, I know the department's going to respond to the critiques given by uh, Navigant in their review, but I wanted to set the stage in that this further underscores the need for us to have a better management of the utility. Now, I know that some changes have been made recently with respect to how it is that security personnel uh, responsibilities flow to the general manager. But as you all give us a presentation, help us understand what tuning we've done recently. But specifically, help me understand two things. The Navigant report pointed out some high priority items that needed to be remediated pretty quickly. So that's the thing that I'm chiefly concerned about. But secondly, uh, I'm really concerned about how it is that the reporting is currently happening to today. Mr. Koretz put forward a motion, as a matter of example, uh, a few months ago, a, a year ago, on security. The report came back and highlighted virtually nothing in terms of there being problems. The report said, here it is, how it is that we report, here are the compliance issues, and it was a four-page document that didn't tell us an awful lot. It wasn't until Navigant did their third-party review, concluded in December, and then, by some mistake, an unredacted version, is that correct? An unredacted version of the report makes its way into the press and we find out that there are at least four or five instances of real vulnerabilities to some of the more critical assets of the Department of Water and Power. So, it, but for that accident, I wouldn't have known what the issues were with any specificity. And so now we have a couple of things that I think are at odds with one another. We've got a redacted version that points out some vulnerabilities. We've got a report dated from seven to nine months ago that says we're in compliance. And then we've got a list of high priority items that need to be remediated. And most recently, some changes at the, as of last week, some changes at the utility as to who is wearing the hat of chief security officer. So if you all in your, as best as you can in your presentation, can help me understand uh, what is happening, then I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions that would probably most be appropriate for closed session. But not today. But not today. We're not agendized for closed session? So if I want to ask questions about the relationship between LAPD, its Archangel project, and the department to see where it is that we have vulnerabilities and how often we test those, can we talk about those in open session? I, I would leave it to department staff to be able to discern what questions and answers would be prejudicial to the security aspects. So whatever they could answer in open session, uh, leave it to their discretion. If this can, needs to be agendized for a future closed session with appropriate language, perhaps that could be made for a, a, a meeting next week or in the next few weeks. Okay. Well, gentlemen, do the best that you can. Um, Jeff Peltola, Chief Financial Officer for DWP. 
I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to talk about the security measures we took as part of this survey. It's just going to take two minutes. We went through and worked with Navigant uh, to set up a data room to review the confidential. It was a data room that was secured with lock cabinets, no Wi-Fi service. We assigned personnel in that data room to ensure there were no pictures taken, no confidential documents left the room. Consultants had to sign in and out. We logged all those documents. We made sure that when anyone left the room, those documents were still there. This is all in compliance with the 2015 NERC, um, which is very important to the department. Um, we made sure there were background checks on both uh, the consultants that went to the data room as well as our personnel that were in the data room. Um, after the data room review per Navigant's request, we, we had those documents transferred to our corporate performance office with a lock stored in a lock cabinet. Um, DWP Security Services Management, and David's going to talk a little bit about that, reviewed the draft report, but it was via projector, not even a PDF. So the unredacted version that you're talking about um, was something that we, when we reviewed that, we could only look at on a projector. We did not get a hard copy of that ahead of time. All confidential documents were returned to the respective operating divisions, but while all these steps were taken to ensure confidentiality of the documents, the consultants used a redaction method that was defeated by a member of the, of the press. David is going to talk about the response even to the unredacted parts of it, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of context as to what steps and measures we took. But on that point, if you could, sp so you said it was defeated by a member of the press. So Correct. If, if, if a reporter can find out where it is that we haven't done any maintenance or, or taken corrective action to some problems in our security, right. do we know how that happened? We know how they um, took the redaction and how it was done by the consultant and what they did. And we have subsequently, uh, as quickly as we could, we removed those documents from the, uh, uh, from the web. And they've put them back there with a total um, deletion of those, of those portions. So I, I think this is important. Then I'll sit down and listen to the presentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, a critical document was put up on the web right. that pointed out some of these vulnerabilities that we were in the course of re uh, fixing. Who put that stuff on the web? That, that, that was put up actually by the consultant, by Navigant. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Dave Wright, Chief, o Chief of Operating Officer of LADWP. I'd like to make a presentation that summarizes some of our critical infrastructure protection efforts. So um, the IEA survey, as Jeff just said, that provided an incomplete picture of the security efforts and that, that survey states that the last review was done in 2001 and actually there were additional reviews that have occurred and we provided those reviews to the consultant. They even listed it in their record of reviews that we provided to them but they, they never cited them and never discussed them in the report. Some of those updates are there was an um, MAI International did a review of our, our security, physical security in 2006, 2008. <clears throat> Excuse me. LAPD did an Archangel review in 2008. We're right now in the middle of a, law, a lengthy review that complies with NERC. NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Council that all utilities have to adhere to security standards they put forth. So we've gone through a, a critical infrastructure protection review that's near completion. It's being reviewed right now. Um, these assessments document the evolving nature of the threats. Um, many of the re recommendations were implemented. Some were deemed after time to be either redundant, unnecessary, or other items were put in place that, uh, that took their, their place. And these improvements have been made at major facilities, and I'm going to talk about a few of them. Um, at an office building, and they're, they're talked about more in a generic nature, at an office building, Critical assets were backed up or relocated. We've added medical, metal detectors, turnstiles, electronic access, monitoring systems, kiosk cameras, safe rooms. The control center um, added a heavy-duty gate. Security officers are assigned 24-7. Secure building entrance with an, an entrance where you can get inside the building uh, just inside the front door but can't move beyond that area until you go through a security clearing. Um, that security clearing is protected by bulletproof glass. There's other items there, electronics access, video surveillance. Also, any delivery truck or visitor coming in is checked in, but we're looking at should we even increase beyond what we currently do 
when there's delivery trucks or, or other packages delivered. At a filtration plant, continual review and upgrade of the perimeter, uh, barriers, bollards, walls, barriers, K-rails, video surveillance, key card access, and specific procedures for vendor, visitor, and delivery check-in. Um, at a generating station, security cameras monitor the entire perimeter and other cyber assets. Security officers are there 24-7. Uh, the perimeter fence is topped with razor wire and there's key card access. Uh, new added security booth at the entrance. Um, better lighting to see uh, who's coming in in darkness. Uh, and then procedures again for visitor, vendor, and delivery check-in. And there uh, was some vegetation along the fences which has been trimmed back. Switching station, which is a major yard where transmission station lines come in and are routed to different directions in different places. Security cameras added to monitor the critical cyber assets. Key card access has been implemented. Building security status is monitored at a central station and cameras are in place and working at that location. Um, we do ongoing visual monitoring throughout our entire system. We have over a thousand cameras that are monitored 24 seven. Um, some of those cameras were going out and a few years ago they were at four, there were 40% outages, but they're down to 6%. Um, we plan to expand that to 2,500 cameras and also utilize software that can determine when there's movement in, uh, in the, the visuals that those cameras are monitoring so that you can have a more targeted review and targeted security response. That I talked about the, the NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and from 2000, actually 1998 through today, they continue to increase the security efforts that need to be taken by all electric utilities throughout the United States, actually throughout North America. Um, we are going through what's called the physical security SIP 14 requirements. That requires us all to do a threat and vulnerability assessment. Risk, look at the risks that would occur from widespread instability, an uncontrolled separation or cascading, where cascading is where one outage causes a number of outages throughout, uh, like in this instance, the Western United States. Um, they do recognize that there are financial constraints and we've identified all of our facilities that meet the criteria. Um, we're in the process of having an independent consultant review that. NERC requires that. NERC is is also monitored by FERC, which everything has an acronym. That's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we are looking at reviewing the assessments, suggesting improvements, a third party and consultant is validating the findings and assisting with the increased development of a security plan. Um, some of those assessments uh, are, are completed, and in fact, most of them are, and um, they're with the third party consultant, the independent consultant to review them they'll be finished and completed and reported to management by June 23, 2016. Um, we also have a very significant cybersecurity program. That's actually one of the most important areas we need to protect our cybersecurity efforts. We've got dedicated staff. They have um, a lot of certifications. Um, that show they've been through the adequate training. We have a policy that's not just vetted by us, but multiple agencies. We've done multiple assessments of the security. We do regular scans of all of our outfacing or outward facing service um, servers and applications, multiple levels of security, a lot of different programming security that, um, that helps protect our systems. We actually work with USC and JPL on testing and implementing experimental systems. And we share, most importantly, we share our information with other utilities and they share it with us and we also share it with the state and federal security agencies. Um, we have performed ongoing security since 2001 and before, but stepped up and have um, done that throughout the last couple decades. Um, we are on schedule with the physical security threat and vulnerability assessment from NERC. We're compliant with that NERC, those NERC and FERC requirements. Um, we're continually reviewing those and upgrading those. And one of the things that we, that, um, that we do know we now need to look at improving further is doing that testing, the auditing, the surprise testing to validate our security efforts. And we'll be putting that in place um, and improving that. 
I, I, as Councilman Fuentes said, there have been some changes. We are uh, starting the process to recruit for a new security officer. Uh, that position will report to the chief operating officer at the utility. Um, with that, I'd be uh, happy to either answer any questions or discuss what uh, we might need to discuss in close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, let's start with the last thing first about your efforts to recruit a new security uh, chief. Is that the correct term? Uh, security officer. Security officer. So it was reported in the Daily News that we had one last week, and it sounds like we've got an interim this week. That's that's correct. So clearly there have been some changes on what is a very critical sort of decision that needs to be made by the department. I, I think where I'd like a little bit of clarity is it's my understanding that at some point in the department's history, the commission used to have a committee on security. Is that accurate? I, I'm not aware of that, but I, I, I will find that out. Okay, and so, so the, the reason I ask is because it's my understanding that there was also then a process by which we found presumably the best possible person for the job to head up security at LADWP, and rightfully so because it is a critical piece of infrastructure. The city will not run, literally, if there are problems at the utility. This process, though, seems to be a little bit ambiguous to me because I don't know how that selection will go. It's in the jurisdiction, presumably, of the general manager and the commission, but it's my understanding that previously there was a panel of people, including the commission, as well as the Los Angeles Police Department's participation in the recruitment of the candidate. To me, that's very important because the part that seems to be missing in all of this, in my mind, is a linkage between the utility and the Los Angeles Police Department, in particular the Archangel Group, which is the group that is trusted with threat assessment to the city of Los Angeles. I find that we have a very similar situation like we recently had at LAUSD, where we leave the decision on some critical infrastructure to, in this case with all due respect to the commission and the general manager, non-security personnel to make a decision. Here, presumably, we've got all of the talent, all of the capability, and certainly all the resources in the Los Angeles Police Department to inform better outcomes at the utility, and there doesn't appear to be a linkage. And worse, it appears that we are going to hire somebody very quickly as a result of concerns that are in the press and most recently in this report. So it just underscores, I think, the need for us to be in a position to better manage the utility but primarily the order of importance. There are a lot of things in this Navigant report that bring me a lot of um, concern. The business continu continuation model and management, for example, if there's a seismic event, the report seems to infer that we are not anywhere near ready in case we have an event. But ironically, the city of Los Angeles has made it a mandate to seismically retrofit soft story buildings, yet when it comes to water and power, we don't have everything built in, at least according to the Navigant report, in order for us to execute a business continuation uh, strategy very quickly. It's an order of priority for me, and, and to me it seems that there is no more important item for us to contemplate at the utility today than the security of the assets and the more than operation and maintenance of some of the problems that were identified, but the prioritization of the security uh, of all those assets. So it's more of a statement, gentlemen. I think there's an awful lot here that I'd like to understand in the coming weeks to months on how it is that we're ticking off the list that Navigant has prepared for us. I understand that there is a distinction from your perspective on how ready we are, but I think the tension that arises from the press, this third-party review, and clearly your perspective is what we need to make sure that this department is safe, secure, and reliable. And it's my sense that on the order of priority, we're not where we probably could be and certainly where we have the assets and the tools to be. And so I'd like for us to continue this conversation, but I, I want to end with this, colleagues that the question about accountability and responsibility, it's been scattered, it relates to this utility throughout the entire city of Los Angeles. The opportunity for us to take charge is before us in trying to understand if we're going to revise this charter so that we have a better handle on the management of the utility. That literally, Council President Wesson, is before us today. We have the opportunity to move forward and have a conversation as to whether we should reform this charter. 
If there's one reason to consider that, it's the security and reliability of this utility to its residents. This really troubles me. And the linkages that we need to create or firm up, let me say, to the utility and its independent ability to operate couldn't be more important. So colleagues, I, I would ask that you pay an awful lot of attention in the coming weeks to months to this issue in particular with security. Thank you, Madam President, for the extension of time. Thank you, Mr. Fuentes. Mr. Corretz? Thank you, Madam President. Well, now that the DWP Navigant report has come out and essentially concern, confirmed the concerns that I had over a year ago when I introduced uh, this motion, um, I'd like to ask that we note and file my motion uh, because it's not now as topical and here item 28. I do want to note, however, that had we actually heard my motion um, in a timely manner last year, perhaps we could have asked the tough questions and we might be a year ahead of where we are now in making our grid safer and more secure for all the residents and businesses of Los Angeles. Now, I got interested in the overall security of our grid in 2013 when some folks with rifles attacked San Jose substation, damaging 17 transformers and causing $15 million worth in damage and got off scot-free. And the closer I looked, the worse things got. People who know what they're doing could cause blackouts that could last for weeks or even months, which is why I introduced my own motion on grid security back in 2014. And San Jose was a physical attack. Cyber attacks can be even worse. We hear about them daily. Um, the most famous was North Korea infiltrating uh, Sony Pictures to stop them from releasing a movie. But now, for the first time, small committed groups of people can literally destroy our criti critical infrastructure, uh, both using cyber methods and physical methods. The well-respected journalist Ted Koppel um, has just published an entire book on just this subject called Lights Out, A Nation Unprepared, which details not only how vulnerable the electrical grid is, but how woefully unprepared we are as a country to live without electricity for weeks or months as a damaged grid is rebuilt. That's weeks or months without water and without our usual food distribution system in place. Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts, who's leading the fight in Congress to strengthen grid security, was asked by Koppel to respond to the Department of Homeland Security officials who insist the grid is resilient. He said, quote, they are ignoring the warnings of almost every national security expert who has studied the issue. George Kottner, the former chief scientist at the National Security Agency, says in his fourth white paper on the issue of grid security that, quote, the nation has little or no chance of withstanding a major cyber attack on the North American electrical system. The, the electric power industry is simply unrealistic in believing in the resistance resilience of this grid subject to a sophisticated attack. When such an attack occurs, make no mistake, there will be major loss of life and serious crippling of national security capabilities." End quote. DWP's response to my motion said basically, they're on top of this. The Navigant report says they're not. My research has shown that it's not just DWP who isn't taking this seriously enough, but the entire industry across the country. I'd like to see Los Angeles lead the way. Get it right, share what we've learned with the rest of the country, and I'd like to see the federal government foot the bill. Until DWP is better prepared, I believe our residents need to know the risks and that they need to hear what our emergency management department is doing to prepare for a long-term power outage. I'm introducing a motion today asking our emergency management department to report back on exactly that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. There are no more members on the queue, but I have several cards on both um, item 27 and, I'm sorry, 28 and 29. On item 28, Dan is the first speaker. Are you here? Dan on item 28. I see no one from Rabbit gone on item 28. Robert, gone. Good morning, sir. 